And again, I'd like to welcome you to our AWS webcast today, High Availability with Route 53 DNS Failover. Our presenters today are Sean Meckley, the Product Manager with Amazon Route 53, and also Paul Kearney, who's the Chief Software Architect at Infospace. Sean, I will hand it off to you. Thank you, Aurora. Again, this is Sean Meckley, Product Manager for Amazon's Route 53. So today we'll be talking just very briefly about what Route 53 is for those that are new to the service. Uh, then we'll walk through what is DNS failover, what does it do, um, and a bit about how it functions. Then we'll talk about some of the high availability architectures that are enabled by DNS failover. We'll talk about the different types of endpoints. Uh, first of all, what endpoints are, and then how you can actually uh, perform DNS failover for the different types of endpoints of your application. We'll talk about how you can view the health status of your endpoints. And then I'll hand it over to Paul Kearney from Infospace, who will walk through an example of how he and his team use DNS failover to enable multi-region application on AWS, uh, including DNS failover. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions and answers. So first, what is Route 53 for those new to the service? Route 53 is AWS's DNS service. We consider DNS a tier zero service. Uh, DNS needs to be up and running in order for your application or your website to be reachable by your end users. So we uh, take availability extremely seriously. Uh, we do offer 100% SLA, for example, for Route 53. The service is built to be highly available and scalable to respond to increases in traffic to your site. And we do offer tools enabling you, the customer, to uh, provide high performance and highly available architectures on AWS. And so DNS failover as a new feature is one more tool uh, in the, the bag that allows you to architect your application to be uh, that much more reliable. So briefly, how DNS works and what it does is it translates domain names into IP addresses, which then enable your users via their web browsers or other clients to access your website or your web application. Uh, Route 53 returns the authoritative responses to these DNS queries, and by dynamically um, uh, incorporating logic to return different IP address answers, Route 53 enables uh, various architectures which allow you to, for example, run in multiple locations around the world for higher performance uh, for your end users, uh, to also have redundant locations uh, and then dynamically respond uh, to failure events in your application by vending different IP addresses in response, uh, thereby routing your end users intelligently to locations where your application is up and running. So what is DNS failover? What does this new feature do? Well, DNS failover really consists of two components. The first is health checks, which is Route 53's checking your application uh, on a constant basis to verify that each location where your, your application is running is healthy and uh, reachable from the outside internet. And then failover, takes the results of those health checks, whether each location of your, your website is healthy or not, and intelligently only returning the answers, the IP addresses corresponding to healthy locations of your website, thereby rerouting users away from any location of your, uh, of your website that is either failed or unreachable from the outside internet. So why are our customers interested in DNS failover? Well, two things. One is it provides uh, a variety of tools that allow you to build more uh, redundant uh, applications and more reliable applications on AWS so that you can configure a variety of backup scenarios uh, from ranging from very simple, uh, very simple backup uh, static page all the way to you know, fully redundant application stacks from multiple regions. And secondly, it enables you to run in multiple regions of AWS in a way that uh, responds intelligently to a failure of your application in any one of those regions, thereby taking that region out of service for your application and rerouting users to uh, regions where your application is healthy. So 
So throughout this webinar, we'll be using a couple of terms that I think it uh, will be helpful to define up front. So first, an endpoint is an internet location belonging to you, basically, which uh, you can define one of two ways, either by giving us an IP address and URL, which we then make internet requests to uh, repeatedly to, to check that there's a response, a successful response coming from that location, or by giving us the name of an elastic load balancer, which we then uh, are checking through a variety of means to make sure that the load balancer is healthy and that your application is healthy behind that load balancer. So we're constantly checking the health of that endpoint uh, from, the point, from the time that you define that endpoint in the Route 53 interface. Second term is the health check. That's the thing that you're actually creating within Route 53, which tells us to check that endpoint. That health check persists for as long as uh, you're using it in your DNS configuration. And that health check then has a status of either healthy or unhealthy um, at a particular point in time based on the results of our pinging that endpoint uh, and determining whether it's returning a valid response or not. Once you've created your health check, then you can use that health check in your DNS configuration. You can associate one or more DNS records to basically depend on that health check either being healthy or being unhealthy. And that's the, the way that you uh, configure the DNS be failover behavior that you want. So how does it work? Well, for every endpoint that you define, or so for every health check that you create, Route 53 will begin probing that endpoint from within every AWS region. So currently that's eight regions around the world. Uh, and we are checking every endpoint from every uh, single region just to ensure that we're checking it from as many different points across the Internet as possible, uh, thereby capturing also any connectivity issues between one, one region of the world and another, as well as determining the, the health of the actual endpoint. So to perform the health check, uh, our, our health checking system is making internet requests to your specified endpoint. And if we get a successful response, so for example, a, an HTTP 200 or a 300 code, then the health check passes. If we get no response, or if we get an HTTP error code, for example, 400 or above, then the health check fails. When the health check fails, then that drives our DNS routing behavior. So any DNS records that you had configured to depend on the health check passing become inactive, and any DNS records that you've configured as backups or d depending on the health check failing then become active. And that is the mechanism by which your traffic gets rerouted to your backup location. Now previous to uh, DNS failover being available, uh, customers had had to make these DNS changes manually in response to failure. So, for example, um, let's say that you have a primary website and then a backup site. Typically, you would have to have alarming on your primary site, and then that would trigger someone getting paged. In your organization, they would then have to go in and make some DNS configuration changes to reroute traffic in response to that failure. That could take easily many, many minutes or even hours to complete. Um, DNS failover, once you've configured it up front, the actual failover is completely automatic uh, from us detecting the failure to us rerouting traffic to your backup location. And that all happens from the time that the endpoint fails to traffic flowing to the backup site within about three minutes. That includes the time for us to detect the failure and then also the time for the DNS changes to propagate across the Internet. And so that's, that's definitely a huge improvement uh, over what customers um, had been managing themselves when, when failover was more of a manual process. So DNS failover enables two basic scenarios, uh, and then there's a variety of, of variations within those, but we really think of it in, in terms of two basic scenarios. The first is what we call simple failover or active standby. You can think of this as having your primary website or application and then a simple static backup site. So for example, a, um, a fail whale type of page is, a, is an example um, of, of a, a very static 
page that simply acknowledges to customers that you're experiencing difficulty, maybe providing an alternate way to, to contact you. Uh, so keeping some web presence even if your primary site goes down. Uh, so in this configuration, ordinarily when your, your primary website is healthy, all traffic is flowing to that primary site and no traffic is flowing to your backup site. In the event that your primary site goes down, Route 53 will detect that and reroute all traffic to your backup site. Now that backup site could be hosted on Amazon AC2. It could also be hosted on Amazon S3 using S3's uh, website hosting functionality. That actually provides a very cost-effective and very reliable way to host a simple uh, static backup site. So we do see a large number of customers uh, starting to adopt that feature. The other main scenario is what we call active-active. And this is for when you want to run your primary application in multiple locations simultaneously. Now you can do that using a couple of Route 53 features. One is latency-based routing, and that allows you to run in multiple AWS regions and route end users to the closest region to them in terms of internet latency. That uh, allows you to really reduce latency experienced by your end users if they're spread around the world. Um, and that feature has been around for a little over a year. DNS failover adds a new capability to that, which is that if any of those regions becomes unreachable to your end users, either your application happens to go down in that region or there's some kind of activity issue or some region-wide issue, Route 53 will detect that and respond to that by removing that region from consideration. And in that way, the end users that had been going to that region would be intelligently rerouted to the next closest region to them. So basically it's as if that region no longer existed in your configuration. All traffic would then flow to the other healthy regions. So the simple failover use case in diagram form, you can see here uh, that you have an application stack running in an AWS region. That's over on the left side of the slide. And Amazon Route 53 is routing traffic to that region. Um, that's your primary record uh, that you've configured in your DNS configuration. And then you've also set up a health check in Route 53, verifying that that application is healthy. Then you can see that uh, there's also a secondary site, which is your gone phishing page in this example, hosted on Amazon S3, that is inactive at this time. Uh, because your primary site is healthy and the health check is, is returning a healthy response. Now if your primary application goes down, you can see that the health check becomes unhealthy. Route 53 will respond to that by no longer routing traffic to your primary endpoint and instead routing all traffic to your secondary endpoint or your gone phishing page. A multi-region example, you can see here that there's two or more identical application stacks running in multiple AWS regions. And so for each region, there is going to be a DNS record. Here we're using latency-based routing to distribute traffic among your regions based on where your end users are located, routing your end users to the closest location uh, to them in terms of, of internet latency. And then for each application stack, there is a health check. And so in this example, you can see that both health checks are currently healthy, and so both regions are going to be active. Both regions will have traffic flowing to them. In the event that one region becomes unavailable, again, this could be due to your own application going down, it could be due to some, some regional issue, Route 53 would detect that via the health check. In this case, the health check becomes unhealthy. Route 53 stops routing traffic to that region, and all of the traffic that had been going to that region would be rerouted. So then each end user would be routed to the next closest region to that user in terms of internet latency. So you can health check and configure DNS failover for a variety of endpoints. Those endpoints can be, for example, an EC2 instance, it could be an elastic load balancer, or it could actually be 
uh, an application running in your own data center off of AWS, for example. We do have a number of customers uh, building backup or disaster recovery scenarios for applications that, for whatever reason, uh, are still running in their own data center, um, but they do create a backup uh, instance in AWS, and you can use DNS failover to fail from one to the other. So first, let's look at elastic load balancers. So DNS failover is actually uh, simplest for elastic load balancers in that you don't actually even have to create your own health check. Route 53 manages the health checking for you completely behind the scenes. All you do in this case is check a box in the Route 53 console to enable DNS failover and you're essentially done. So let's look at that in the console. In the Route 53 console, you would start in your hosted zones tab and go to the records, uh, record set page. Here you can see that we're creating a DNS record pointing to an elastic load balancer. Uh, we're using the alias record type to point to that load balancer. And then in the expanded uh, right-hand section of the, the page here, in this expanded pane, you can see that there's a checkbox for evaluate target health. And you simply check yes, and that tells Route 53 to start using the, the results of the health check health checking that Route 53 already maintains for every elastic load balancer. So you don't actually have to create a health check, you simply check the box, and that enables Route 53 to start evaluating whether that load balancer is healthy, as well as whether the EC2 instances behind that load balancer are healthy. Once you've selected evaluate target health, then you use one of the uh, routing policy options. Uh, to determine whether that endpoint is going to be your primary or your backup or whether you're going to use it alongside other endpoints in an active-active scenario. For EC2 instances, there is one more step, which is that you do create your own health check within Route 53 of that EC2 instance. So the two-step process is first you create the health check and then second, you associate that health check with one or more DNS records or resource record sets. The process is very similar for an endpoint that resides outside of AWS. Uh, for these endpoints, um, there is a requirement that, there, that the endpoint have a fixed IP address. And if you were, once you know the IP address of that endpoint, you would create a health check just like you would for an EC2 instance and then you would associate one or more DNS records with that health check. So step one is you create the health check in the Route 53 console. So you go to the health checks tab in the Route 53 console, click create health check. And now you're prompted for several values which define the endpoint that we will be checking for you. So first you can choose one of two protocols, either HTTP or TCP. Then you specify the IP address. Again, the endpoint uh, must have a fixed IP address for us to be able to health check it. Then you specify the port. And then for HTTP health checks, you uh, provide the host name which is basically your domain name, and then the path to the actual page or file that you want us to retrieve. So some customers have us simply check the home page or your index.html page. Other customers have a dedicated uh, web page as the target of that health check. So you can specify that page here. Once you've created the health check, it shows up uh, in the Health Checks tab. From here, then you use this health check that you've just created and you associate this health check with one or more resource record sets. So you go to the Record Sets tab in the console. And then in the uh, expanded right-hand pane here, you can see at the bottom there is the option to associate record set with health check. That's at the bottom right of the slide here. You select yes, 
and then there's a drop-down list where you can select the health check that you've just created. And so by checking yes and then selecting the health check, you have now made this DNS record depend on that health check. And from here then you can, again, select the routing policy that you want, either failover for that uh, simple backup scenario, or latency-based routing, or weighted route robin, either of those two will then enable you to run that active-active scenario. Every health check has a status at any given point in time of healthy or unhealthy based on the results of our observing or making requests to your endpoint. And you can see the status of that health check and you can actually also then trigger notifications and automated actions based on the, the health status. So how you see status of your health checks is uh, that each health check publishes its results to Amazon CloudWatch as a CloudWatch metric. And so like any metric that exists in CloudWatch, you can view a graph of the, the health check status over time in the AWS Management Console. And then you can also configure alarms and notifications based on that metric changing a value. So for example, you can set an alarm if the health check goes from healthy to unhealthy or vice versa. Okay. So to view the status of any health check, you can start within the Route 53 console. You go to the health checks tab and all the way on the right hand side of the list of health checks, you will see a link for view graph. If you click that link for your desired health check that you want to see the status of. That will take you to the CloudWatch console. And in the CloudWatch console, then, you will see a graph of the health check status over time. And like any CloudWatch metric, you can configure the graph. It has multiple parameters that you can adjust. You can adjust the time frame that you want to graph over. There's a number of different statistics that you can look at, the maximum or average or minimum. Typically, customers will want to use the maximum statistic, and uh, this returns a value of between one and zero. Uh, one corresponds to your, health, your endpoint being healthy, and zero corresponds to your endpoint being unhealthy. Now, depending on the statistic that you use, whether it's maximum or average, uh, it's possible to see intermediate values between one and zero. Those correspond to some of our health checkers in the different AWS regions seeing your endpoint as healthy and others seeing it as unhealthy. Um, typically, most customers aren't going to be terribly concerned about those intermediate values. Um, anything less than a one can be considered a failing endpoint. But for customers that are interested in seeing whether uh, there's regional connectivity issues between one region and another, um, or potentially that your endpoint is browning out or returning inter intermittent failures. Uh, you can see some of that via these intermediate values between one and zero. So like any other CloudWatch metric, you can then create alarms based on the metric and from those alarms, then you, could cre you can use the Simple Notification Service, or SNS, to trigger emails or other types of notifications to you when your endpoint uh, becomes unhealthy or if its status flips from, from one status to another. So, for example, here uh, we see the CloudWatch uh, configuration wizard to, to set up an alarm. Um, Typically, if you want to alarm on the health check going from healthy to unhealthy, you would configure the metric or configure the alarm to trigger uh, whenever the health check status has a value less than one. That would indicate that one or more Route 53 health checkers are seeing that endpoint as unhealthy. From this point, then, you can configure email notifications or any other type of notification that SNS supports. So now we'll hand it over to Paul Kearney from InfoSpace, who will talk about how he and his team are using DNS failover to run in multiple AWS regions. Thanks, Sean. So InfoSpace has 
uh, we've just finished a project of migrating our search application out of our two data centers and into multiple AWS regions. So I'll share a little bit about the story of how Route 53 plays a key component in that uh, migration effort and how we operate our uh, services in AWS today. Infospace um, has a lot, uh, several different products. One of our products is a search product. Um, that's been our core since 1996 when the company was founded. And uh, our mission is to make it uh, fast and easy for users to find what they need online. My name is Paul. I uh, oversee the architecture here at Infospace, and you can read more about our uh, technology that drives Infospace at uh, tech.infospace.com. So Infospace Search, our search product is uh, it's a Windows stack. I'm having trouble with, there we go. Our search product is uh, entirely based on Windows. It's an ASP.NET application. We have two primary search products. The first one are the search sites that we own and operate. So these sites include things like dogpile.com, metacrawler, webfetch, and webcrawler. And these are end user facing sites where people can go and uh, search the internet like you might do at Google. The other product that we have is a search API that we white label and um, expose to our distribution partners. So our distribution partners have sites that they own and operate, and if they want to include search results on their site and be able to monetize those results, we provide an API for which they can do that through. So different types of users that we have, uh, we have search site users. So these are like visitors that might come to dogpile.com. These users uh, run about 400 million queries per month, and because they're hitting our, our um, our website, they are you know, distributed all over the world. We see, um, we see search site users come from every country. Our search API partners are more clustered. They, there's about 150 partners that we have, and these tend to you know, operate either out of cloud providers or out of data centers. So they tend to come from um, large cities. Uh, they're primarily clustered in the US and the EU. And these guys uh, give us about 2 billion queries per month. And then the third type of user kind of spans both search site users as well as search API users. And we call these the click users. So if you come to a search site or you go to one of our partner sites, you will get results. And when you click on one of those results, we do some logging so that we can analyze that data. And that is that action we call the click action. Um, so you can imagine that these, even if you get search results from our search API, which tend to be in, in uh, clustered in geographical areas, the click user that comes from the partner site could still be dispersed across the world. There's about six and a half billion clicks per month that we see on our click servers. So our distribution of traffic looks like this. We operate today out of three AWS regions uh, in the US West 2, in US East 1, and in EU West 1. We, uh, we operate out of multiple availability zones within each AWS region. The partners who call our search APIs using latency-based routing um, are routed to the AWS region that is closest from where they are accessing us. We operate thus, in, uh, referring back to Sean's different types of um, DNS failover architectures, we operate in an active-active mode. So e any of our AWS regions um, are able to serve a request at any time. Our search site users are routed to the region that is least latent from wherever they're accessing our point from. And then finally, click servers who may be in different geographical locations than those other two, um, whether they're coming from an API partner site or from one of our hosted search sites, they are also routed to the region that is least latent from their location. And the cool thing that we have found with uh, Route 53 and the 
and um, being a multi-region is that we can then analyze our traffic and find additional AWS regions that might provide a better service to our end users and use Route 53 to automatically route that traffic that to, again, to the least latent region. We have, we use Route 53 DNS failover to provide high availability between these regions. So if one of these regions were to go offline or experience a problem, the traffic that was routed originally to that region will then be rerouted to the other regions. We used to do this in our data center um, by, because we operated two data centers. We would, we implemented this by using some expensive network gear that would automatically handle the rerouting between the data centers if one was providing a problem. Once we moved into AWS, before these uh, health checks were available for Route 53, we did this manually. So we would get an alarm, we would change some DNS records, and uh, point, point traffic to the healthy regions. Um, now with the automatic health checks, we see that um, there, there's no manual intervention. It's all automatic and it's handled for us. So the way that we set this up, uh, we, we actually created the um, DNS health checks prior to it being exposed in the AWS console. So it was only available through the API when we did this. So we crafted a XML request that set up, this was our first test to just see how this service would work for us. We created a, um, a new record set that pointed to two different regions. So here we have an XML request that creates a record pointing to an ELB in US West 1 and an ELB in US West 2. We then used DNS curl to upload this file to the uh, Route 53 API, which then created the records for us. We were then able to confirm in the management console that the records were created. It's just that the UI had not been exposed to actually edit the records yet. So then we ran a simple bash script. And what this script does, did was, in each of those two regions, we put one instance behind each ELB. And those instances just simply returned a string that was the region that that instance was running in. So we returned back US West 1 or US West 2, depending on which region it was running in. Then we ran this bash script. And what this script did was it looked it, from where we were running the test, it was looking for um, a, the region that it saw, so that was the one that it was least, least latent at the beginning of the test. And we then manually removed an instance from that region, so there was only one instance. When we removed that instance, we watched the script, and as soon as it detected that the new region was being returned as a string, it output the date, so or the timestamp. So we were then able to determine, first of all, that the failover worked correctly as we had expected, and we were also able to get an idea of the time that it took for Route 53 to detect that the one region was no longer available and to start routing traffic to the next region. So this was a simple test that we ran. We realized you know, that everything worked as we had expected. And then we moved into a, a little more um, complicated script to see how this would perform under, uh, under some load. And the way that we did that was using a, a testing system that we have that we call Fire and Forget. So the way that Fire and Forget works is we have two systems. We have a production system and then a system under test. When a user makes a request to the production system, we make an asynchronous request to the system under test, and that request is identical to the request that was received by the user. That asynchronous request is sent with a very short timeout, so the production system doesn't wait for a response. But then both systems, both the production and the system under test, both process that request. And only the production system sends the response back to the user. So this allows us to uh, emulate production traffic, traffic patterns, and traffic loads um, against a separate system outside of our production system. So the way we did this with Fire and Forget and testing 
um, Route 53 DNS failover was we had two data centers. One was on the West Coast, one was on the East Coast. And we set up our search application in two AWS regions, also West and the East Coast. We use latency-based routing to set up fire and forget. So our West Coast data center was firing its traffic off to the West Coast AWS region, and our East Coast data center was firing its traffic to the East Coast AWS region. We then, <clears throat> we then removed all the instances that were behind the ELB in the West Coast region. So we effectively took that region offline. And this is under load, so this is under our production load. And what we noticed was um, the West Coast data center traffic started to fire and forget to the East Coast region uh, within about two and a half minutes. Um, and we, we could verify that through our monitoring systems. When we added the instances back in the West Coast, about two and a half minutes later, we noticed that the traffic then went back to where it was previously, where it was um, firing to both AWS regions as we had expected. So this proves to us that even under load, that this performed exactly as we had anticipated. Um, we use ELB endpoints for our DNS health checks. And uh, one thing that we did notice is that um, we had to rethink the way that our health checks work a little bit in that our, the ELBs have a health check that checks the instances and can remove them in, an, in or out of, the, um, out of the ELB based on the application health. Um, because Route 53 checks the ELB, if only one of those instances is healthy, Route 53 will continue to send traffic to that region. And we may not, one instance behind that ELB may not be sufficient to handle the load that would be delivered to that region. So we rethought the way that we handle those health checks, and there's a little bit more intelligence in there that after a kind of a critical mass, um, after we go below this critical level of instances behind one ELB, those instances will start to return that they are unhealthy, even though they might be healthy. Um, and this helped us to uh, make sure that we weren't going to flood a region that was having trouble um, with a whole bunch of traffic. So the results that we found was that we got consistently in about 150 seconds regional failover. Um, we have actually observed this once in production where we, uh, it was the middle of the night and there was an issue in a region and the DNS swung the traffic to a new region and within about five minutes that um, issue had been corrected and the traffic swung back automatically. We've also noticed because of latency-based routing that we can deliver our search results to our API partners and to our search site end users um, with about 25% less latency. Um, this is largely because we now have an international presence but also because Route 53 is constantly evaluating that latency uh, for us and delivering, delivering user requests to the region that is the least latent for them. Oh, sorry, the uh, slide jumped on me there. And then the last one was that we were able to replace um, all of this expensive network gear. This was a, a hardware refresh year for us. And so we were able to actually replace that gear that was in the data center that performed this function for us with Route 53. Um, and it gave us, for our use, um, service that was on par with what that expensive gear had done for us. And that concludes my portion. Great, thank you, Paul. So now we'll move to the Q&A. We have uh, some great questions from the audience, and so uh, Jared Guthrie from our team will read off some of the questions. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we have a question from Jason who asks, how does DNS caching affect Route 53? Okay, we'll have Lee Zen, uh, Development Manager for Route 53, take that one. Sure, so Route 53 is an authoritative DNS server, so Route 53 doesn't itself cache any answers. Um, but obviously resolvers uh, on the internet will cache uh, answers that Route 53 provides. Um, that's configurable by the customer, obviously, by you uh, with the TTL, and so 
the lifetime of your records is going to be configured by the DTO, but Refit3 itself won't, won't cache anything on, on your behalf or on, on end users' behalf. Thank you. Hey, Paul, this question is for you. Uh, you mentioned a uh, URL, I believe, where people could go to learn more about uh, InfoSpace technology. Someone asked uh, the location of that URL. Sure. It's a blog that we just launched recently, and um, we are starting to chronicle our migration experience from the data center to AWS. And the URL is tech, T-E-C-H, dot infospace, dot com. Thank you, Paul. Uh, this question is from Carlos. Um, is it possible to create failover between availability zones instead of regions? Uh, yes. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, you can specify one endpoint in one availability zone and another endpoint in another availability zone. Um, generally, you would be using EC2 instances as the endpoint in each case. And then um, you wouldn't use latency-based routing because those instances would be in the same region, but you can use weighted round robin, which is another routing um, feature of Route 53 that allows you to split traffic in any proportion that you want across multiple endpoints. So you could, for example, uh, not just use two availability zones, you could use three or more um, and use weighted round robin to distribute traffic among those. Um, typically, we see customers using elastic load balancing, which does the same thing, um, but there are some customers with specific technical requirements that are, are not using elastic load balancing. and in that case, you can use Route 53 with weighted round robin to split traffic among um, different availability zones in the same region. That, that will work. This question is from Brian. Does Route 53 support HTTPS health checks? Okay. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, we do not support health checks over HTTPS. Um, our customers uh, tend to use one of two possible workarounds. Uh, for websites that are available only over HTTPS. Um, the first workaround is to health check over TCP on port 443. Uh, and the other option is to expose a dedicated uh, web page as the target of the health check, which is available over HTTP. So in that case, you would not be health checking your home page or a particular page on your site um, over HTTPS, but you would expose a dedicated health check target page over HTTP. The question is from John. Uh, what is the cost of a Route 53 health check per month, hour, basically how is it priced? Right. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the pricing per health check uh, depends on whether the, the what we're checking is within AWS or not. Uh, so a health check of an endpoint within AWS is 50 cents per month. Uh, and it's actually, we have a, a, um, the first 50 health checks of endpoints in AWS are free per month, uh, or free, uh, and then any beyond that. So if you have more than 50 EC2 instances, for example, uh, you would be charged 50 cents per month for each additional endpoint that we're checking, uh, or for each additional health check. Now, health checks of endpoints outside of AWS are priced at 75 cents per month. Thank you, Sean. Uh, let's see, this is from Jacob. Is it possible to include a server not hosted in AWS in the failover? The answer is yes. Uh, we do have customers uh, doing this. And as long as you have a, a known IP address for us to check, then you can create the health check of that IP address and then you can use that health check just like any other health check in your DNS configuration. So we do have customers with their primary site outside of AWS and a backup site in AWS, or you can do vice versa, in, you know, any, any configuration that you desire, um, as long as you have a, a fixed IP address that, that we can check. Uh, okay, this is from uh, What can be done to minimize the time taken for DNS propagation propagation that has a higher TTL? Or can we use the same IP address for backup sites? Okay. So in order to minimize the time that it takes for traffic to start flowing to your backup or alternate location, 
that is going to depend directly on the TTL that you have set. So we do recommend a TTL of 60 seconds or less uh, on records that you're using for DNS failover. So if you keep the TTLs low, that will directly affect and, and directly minimize the time taken for failover to, to occur or, or for traffic to start flowing based on that failover having occurred. Um, alias records, uh, which point to elastic load balancers or uh, can also point to S3 websites or to CloudFront distributions, uh, have a non-adjustable TTL, which is 60 seconds. So in those cases, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, for other records, uh, A records or C names, uh, you do configure the TTL yourself, and we do, again, recommend that that be 60 seconds or less. Okay. So regarding uh, 404 errors, uh, at what point, once the 404 occurs, how long will it take to add back if the instance comes back healthy in a few minutes? Sure. So uh, fail... The question is, is about uh, once an endpoint becomes healthy again, um, do we fail back automatically and how long does that take? And the answer is yes, we do fail back automatically. So failover is not sticky in the sense that uh, we will reverse that failover if your primary um, endpoint becomes healthy again. It takes the same amount of time to reverse as it does to, to failover. So it requires three consecutive health check observations um, determining that the health check is, is healthy, just like it would take three failed health check observations for us to determine that it's unhealthy. So that takes a minute and a half, uh, given that the health check observations are 30 seconds apart. And then it takes roughly another minute based on that 60-second TTL uh, on your DNS record. So between two and a half and three minutes for the fail back to occur, just like it takes two and, two and a half to three minutes for the failover to occur. Thanks, Ryan. This is from John. Can the IP address in Create Health Check be internal or external VPC or only internet addresses? Right. So our health checks are conducted from all AWS regions and they go across the public internet. So the IP addresses that we check do need to be reachable from the external world. Uh, and also one other note on that is that uh, depending on the security group configuration that you have, you may need to whitelist or allow incoming traffic from our health checkers. And so we do publish the IP ranges of our health checkers uh, in the Route 53 forum. It's a um, sticky forum post that we will we can we keep updated in the Route 53 forum. So uh, if you do notice that your health checking requests aren't getting through, um, you may want to double check your security group configuration. Okay, this question is for Dave, and you might have, you might have already answered this, but what are the health check intervals? So we check every 30 seconds from every location that we check from. And uh, actually, we check from eight AWS regions, and we also check from two different availability zones in each region. So that's actually a total of 16 different machines or health checkers uh, checking every endpoint. And each one is doing that on an interval of 30 seconds. So uh, you will see requests coming in to your, the target of your health check on average about one every two seconds, given that you have 16 checkers, each checking at 30 second intervals. Uh, this question is from Christopher. Does the primary website have to be hosted with Amazon? Does the backup? Uh, the answer is that in, in neither the primary nor the backup uh, needs to be on, it, on Amazon Web Services. Uh, you can health check at a location outside of AWS as long as it has a known uh, fixed IP address. And uh, you can then make any DNS record dependent on that health check, so your primary or your backup. Uh, so those can point to resources outside of AWS just as easily as within AWS. Um, okay, thank you. A lot of good questions today. Um, in a simple failover scenario, after a failover, does a successful health check on the primary primary initiate an automatic fallback fail, fallback failback sorry to the primary load? Yes. Uh, so we will fail back, uh, revert to the, the primary configuration if your primary endpoint becomes healthy. Um, we do have some customers that have created sort of a sticky failover um, on their own. 
uh, through the notifications that, that you can get from your health check, you can use that to then trigger a script on your end to, for example, remove the, that primary record if you do want that failover to be permanent or more or less permanent so that traffic does not revert back to the primary. Um, but that, that is something that, that you will need to script on your, your own end. Uh, is there a way to set an, a DNS record and use an RDS endpoint? So I, I assume this question is related to uh, associating a health check with an RDS endpoint. Um, given that you could find out the IP address of an RDS endpoint, I guess that's potentially possible. Um, you could look at the IP address for your RDS. If you, assuming you have a single, uh, a single AZ RDS instance, so not, not multi-AZ where it, it is a fixed IP, you could health check that IP over TCP or something like that and associate that with a health check. Um, typically what we actually have heard from customers who want to do something like this is they'll expose an HTTP health check where that HTTP page does do something against the database instance on the back end and then returns the code um, indicating whether the database is healthy or not. So the typical way we see customers do this is they have a page that goes and checks the RDS endpoint that way, they can still use a multi-AZ RDS setup um, and not have to rely on a fixed IP. Thanks, Lee. Uh, Greg asks, is it possible to reduce the 152nd region failover time that Paul mentioned, assuming customers are using the LBs with health checks? With health checks? Uh, at this time, the answer is no. Um, it takes uh, three consecutive health checks uh, which are spaced 30 seconds apart for us to determine that an endpoint is, is truly failed. And then there is the DNS propagation time based on that, that TTL, which also needs to be taken into account. So, so that does leave you in the vicinity of 150 seconds. Um, we're definitely interested in customers, uh, hearing from customers with use cases requiring faster failover um, to understand, you know, is, is there a way to, to trade off uh, you know, some of that health checking behavior or, or just some of the, the configurations on the health checks. Um, so we'd definitely be interested in, in hearing more specifically. So, so we'll follow up on that. Okay. Uh, since you're routing to different regions, how do you synchronize all the data across the region? <laughs> so um, I'll answer that in general terms, and maybe I'll hand it over to, to Paul for his specific application. Um, but customers running in multiple regions do need to manage synchronization of, of data. And so uh, we've definitely seen you know, stateless applications being some of the, the first or the easiest to run in multiple regions. Um, but you know, more stateful applications, uh, there, there does need to be some synchron synchronization that you, as a customer, uh, manage to make sure that each region is, is serving the same data. So Paul, is there anything that you can share specific to your use case? Yeah, I would just say that our search application is uh, for processing a search request is stateless. So we don't have the, um, and we architected it specifically that way, such that um, data refreshes happen in the background, they become eventually consistent, but they're not required to be, uh, to serve a search, a search request, it's not required to be um, all synchronized. We, we just don't have data that we need to synchronize across multiple regions in order to serve a search request. Great, thanks, Paul. Uh, let's see, here's a question from Ivan. Is it possible to permanently keep an active location gone and healthy down instead of automatically adding it back up once it's healthy again? So I've talked to some customers who have created this behavior on their own end um, through uh, some simple scripts that, that they've written that basically look at the result of the health check or look at the actual DNS record that's being returned by Route 53 to detect when that failover occurs. And then that triggers on their own end um, a Route 53 API call to remove the, the previous active record. Um, but that is something that, that you would need to um, script on your own end. The, the, out-of-the-box behavior of Route 53 is to return uh, to the active configuration if that primary endpoint is healthy again. Okay, uh, this is from Patrick. Does the effective failover time on the user side depend on DNS record TTL? Uh, answer is yes. 
and that is why we do recommend that customers set TTLs of 60 seconds or less. Um, alias records pointing at elastic load balancers or S3 websites or CloudFront distributions already have a 60 second TTL that is, is fixed, it's not configurable by the customer. Um, but other records do have configurable TTLs, and again, we do recommend that you keep that low, 60 seconds or, or lower, in order to uh, minimize, because that does directly affect the amount of time that, that users take to start being routed to your backup location. Thanks, John. Uh, I think that wraps up today's session, so if you want to close out. Great. All right. Well, thank every, uh, thanks to everyone for attending, and huge thanks to Paul for sharing InfoSpace with Use Case. And I'd just like to close it out by thanking Sean and Paul today for presenting. And just a reminder to please fill out our survey. Let us know what you thought of today's event. And with that, we'll go ahead and close it out. Have a great day, everyone.